28 North American cities got together and despite the economic woes of the Great Depression, developed the most sophisticated and sassy streetcar ever built, the PCC, or President's Conference Committee Car. Oh. Bob, shite, that's creepy. Oh. How you doing? Oh. You're just sitting oh. here hanging out in the old PCC. Wow. In the atmosphere. I got on these cars when they were brand new and wowie as a kid. Many a pleasant hour was spent in these traveling. Right. Seeing the city. This sleek beast took the public by storm and quickly became the standard in cities all across North America. Toronto was especially enamored and by the 50s had the largest PCC fleet in the entire world! They were amazing as far as what they could carry. When you put a standing load in here, man, you've got a crowd. And you could... And and that's they... what it used to be in rush hour, standing crowds. Were more people, were more people riding oh, of uh, course. cars then? Yes. Yeah, less vehicles on the road, less... slowed down by the automobiles. So right. You could really roll these cars. There was nothing to get one of these up to 60 miles an hour. So, Bob, what do you love about the PCC? Let me show you some of the finer points. Here's one of the features, look at this. Beautiful chrome work. <sighs> look at the windows. All you do is you crank the window up. <laughs> and the seats, they're nice, bouncy seats. Everything in the car was put together nice. Ironically, just as the PCC began to roll off the line, Evil plans were already afoot to kill the streetcar boom. The auto industry was in full swing and car makers needed to convince people that cars were the better way to get around. The best way to succeed was to make them the only way to get around. So General Motors, Standard Oil, Firestone Tires and Mack Truck formed a villainous consortium that secretly bought the streetcar systems in over 100 cities. Their evil plan? to destroy them all. The streetcars were scrapped, their tracks ripped from the ground. In 1949, the conspirators were convicted of US federal antitrust violations and fined one dollar each. The future did not look bright for our elephantine electric friend, but it's super, remember? And it wasn't done yet. Go, go. Most Torontonians will tell you that Toronto is terrific, but in the epic story of the streetcar, it's actually true. It's the only Canadian city that turned a blind eye to the 40s trend of tearing up tracks, and by the mid-60s, it was the only Canadian city with any streetcars at all. By 75, there were only nine cities in North America that were still riding the rails. Certainly in the early 70s, Toronto was one of about 10 cities that still operated streetcars and it was then the largest remaining streetcar system in North America. However, TTC wanted to follow in the footsteps of many other North American cities and get rid of their streetcars. We had a quite a large citizens battle in what was the old city of Toronto, where the streetcars frankly I think were a lot more loved then than they are now because they were much more a part of the city and we were successful in convincing City Council to have the TTC reverse its position and to retain the streetcar system. After that happened, Toronto basically stood still. We've had a few small expansions, but really what we had hoped for in the early 70s in saving the system was that it would become the nucleus of a larger system out into the suburbs, and that has never happened. In truth, Toronto's system has been pretty much stagnant since way back. From 38 to 96, nothing changed. Same cars, same tracks, same system. Two new drivers. That's when the CLRV, or Canadian Light Rail Vehicle, electrified the scene. At first glance, these bad boys may not look like much, but ooh, baby, look out! The CLRV's motor is its primary brake. It also doubles as a power generator whenever the streetcar slows or, get this, stops. 
And this generator converts the energy of motion, which is the kinetic energy, into electrical energy and gets processed and fed back into the grid for other cars on the system to utilize the energy. Just to be safe, streetcars also have two backup brakes. Okay, to have a better look, let's go underneath a streetcar. And the secondary brake is the air brake over here that supports the electrical brake when the energy is not sufficient. And then there's, of course, the third level of braking, which is the track brake. That is the emergency brake and uh, energized magnetically by the, the onboard low voltage system. This is the brain of the streetcar, what we call the ECU or the electronic control unit. Basically, it's the interface between the operator's control console, which and that it processes the signals uh, to the motors and the brake. The streetcar is basically one big car body sitting on two trucks. Basically, they are the undercar carriage to support the car body, which sits on top of it. And each truck consists of a suspension system that has three components to it. And this is the cross member that the car body sits on. And underneath it, there's an air spring. And this gives the secondary suspension. And then the secondary suspension sits on the beam, which is sitting on the coil spring, which is basically the primary suspension. And the coil spring is sitting on the adrenal bearing, and that goes through the axle, and that is sitting obviously on the wheels. The inside of these wheels consists of two layers of rubber blocks sandwiched together to support the steel tire. Yummy. Adding to the streetcar's overall suspension as it moves along the track. The low friction of steel wheels against steel rails means that at a certain point the wheels will slip and spin. To get two smooth surfaces to grip each other, they have to move slowly enough to maintain friction. But once they get going, they can glide for miles as long as they're moving on a smooth, flat surface. Going up hills? can be tough.